welcome to IQ Hitlist Special. I am Vishwa Sadashivan. IQ Hitlist Special is Inconvenient Questions one-on-one -on -one extensive interview that explores the views of an individual that you want to see. Today, my guest is a man who walked the talk as entrepreneur par excellence, has been a strategist for the domestic business sector, and most significantly, a four-term member of parliament with a heart who spoke his mind from the gut. He's clearly one of Singapore's most vocal, honest, and respected politicians. Well, retired politician, to be exact. He stepped down last year. He has been hailed the people's politician. In fact, the manner in which he announced his retirement from politics via Facebook stirred controversy. Although his forte is business issues pertaining mainly to the woes of the SME sector, this man has raised a spectrum of highly inconvenient questions in Parliament. Let me just give you a few examples. First question, why can't we have a two-chamber Parliament or a bicameral parliamentary system for better checks and balances? Why can't we be more bottom-up in policy making? Why can't the government listen more and with an open mind? Why must the front bench in Parliament adopt a sledgehammer approach against MPs who are critical? Why shouldn't PRs who conveniently renounce the PR status to avoid their sons doing national service, why shouldn't they be jailed, like Singaporeans who do, the, who do likewise? To top it, even after stepping down as a ruling party member of parliament, he posted a rigorously analysed and candid critique of the results of last year's general election, where his party won, the PAP won 70% of popular vote. The message was that the PAP had one-off factors that aided its triumph and can't afford to lie on its laurels. So what makes him do this in spite of the possible consequences? What is this man about? Is he a self-serving party turncoat or a true blue party loyalist? Is he critical for populist reasons or is he the quintessential patriot? These are some inconvenient questions I'd like to ask my esteemed guest in the next 50 minutes. I'm expecting him to be as candid with his responses as he was in Parliament. <laughs> My guest is the inimitable Indijit Singh. Indijit, welcome. Hi. Thank you, Viswa. So, how is it having a life? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've uh, been in uh, grassroots and politics for 31 years, actually. Yeah. I started as a grassroots leader and then joined the party in uh, 1984. I fought my first election. Uh, so you contested? Uh, in or 1984, I helped the MP to fight the election. I contested in 1996. So 31 years in politics and grassroots, uh, you know, and uh, almost uh, 20 years as an MP, four terms. Uh, I've uh, spent most of my life serving the country, actually. I'm 55. <laughs> so... Uh, and right through as an MP, you were in Lee Sien Lung's ward. Yeah. yeah I, I, I did my grassroots work in Siglap. Mm. And uh, when I was asked to stand as a candidate, I was sent to understudy Lee Seng Lung in Tegi. Mm. And then uh, I took over Uma Abdul Hamid, who went overseas for studies for about 10 That's months. Right. I basically ran the constituency from 1994 as a second advisor yeah. before I stood for and election subsequently, 96. Subsequently, when um, the late, I mean, when Mr. Bal Dr. Balaji passed away, you covered that as well. Yeah, so uh, in fact, uh, uh, when Dr. Balaji passed away, I covered his uh, constituency and mine. Uh, in fact, when uh, Mr. Seng Han Tong, mm. uh, you know, was attacked by someone, he got burned quite badly, I covered his area for him also. So I spent uh, <laughs> 31 years in politics serving the country, 21 years in Amokyo. Uh, I thought, you know, I've done my part serving the country and I wanted to then focus on other things. Uh, it's not too late, I'm 55, but if I had stayed longer, I think it would have been too late to focus on my family. Was it a, was it a, a difficult decision for you? It, well, you know... Uh, I mean, let's face it, I mean, for four, for four terms, each term five years, yeah. you, know, you are so used to a certain, a certain way of life, right? Constituency, work, and let's face it, a certain amount of respect and regard mm. and standing that yeah. you have as an MP, yeah. right? Uh, you're recognized, mm. sometimes you don't want to be recognized. Yeah. But whatever it is, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel respected that you're doing something that is worthwhile. And suddenly, I, I, from what I gather, people have stepped down. Suddenly, you're out of it. Yeah. Well, for me, it was, not, emptiness. it was not suddenly. Uh, I decided uh, 
uh, in late uh, 2012 and I asked the Prime Minister to let me go in early 2013. So I had a long uh, uh, thought process uh, before I made that decision and then when I told him that I wanted to no, step but Psychologically, down. yes. Yeah. But the fact is the moment you step down, just before the last election, yeah. your life changes, right? Of course. I mean, all... I was told that you, you don't get invited to quite a few functions anymore. And I'm happy You're that happy. I don't have to go to yeah, every but, one of them. <laughs> what, is, what is that feeling? I mean, try it, very honestly. No, I, I can tell you this, that uh, the first two months uh, uh, after stepping down seemed quite odd. My life completely changed because I had such a busy lifestyle. Yeah. But, you know, I uh, took vac uh, vacations with my family in, uh, in December in Australia. And, you know, then I realized, you know, this time I really spent time with the family. Uh, in the past, I, my mind was never with the family. Was it difficult to spend so much of time suddenly with your family? Well, I think... Uh, I, <laughs> was it I, difficult for them? I loved it, but it may have been difficult for them. But I think, uh, you know, uh, timing-wise, uh, and, and therefore, you know, I actually don't feel uh, uh, any regret or, or, or feel set to having left uh, politics because now I really wanted to focus on other things, uh, my career, my job, you know, mm -hmm. my company mm -hmm. and also my family. Uh, children are almost growing up. I, the biggest regret I have, in fact, is not spending enough time with them when I was in politics. You know, uh, I had put priority in politics, serving the country first, and then you know, uh, work and family was you not know, that. So I wanted to change the whole thing. So you know, I actually don't miss it, um, but I recall two uh, uh, politicians who gave me very good advice. One mm. of them was. Abdullah Tamuji, who mm. I served for a long time when, when I came into former politics, speaker. former Speaker of Parliament, his advice to me was, Indajit, the day you step in, be prepared to also st step out. Uh -huh. And uh, the late Mr. Ong Ting Chiang, mm. before he stepped down as a president, uh, I had a chat with him and he gave me exactly the same advice. And so please plan for your, the day that you're going to step down. So I had always uh, prepared. Uh, although I never compromised my contribution to the country, but I was prepared, you know, for this day. Uh, so for except for, except for the first two months, where I feel felt quite funny, not many functions, but uh, you know, uh, reflecting back, uh, I am quite happy I made the decision, and I'm fully adjusted, fully immersed in my job and my company, yeah. and who's spending time with my family. Okay, all that aside, I mean, you are clearly someone because of your number of years in politics as an MP, also because of your involvement on the ground in the SME sector and so on, you're, you're very plugged in, right? I would put it to you this way. You're probably the best candidate to drive a new chapter in the growth of the NGO sector, of civil society. Would you consider that? I mean, it's not about politics per se, you know. The check and balance need not be just within the, the political scene. It can be on the fringes. One of the things that Singapore lacks is a mature, robust civil society. You Can't know, you, would you consider leading it? You know, uh, when I uh, uh, tell someone I stepped out from politics, some of them tell me you never stop being a politician. <laughs> I mean, what it means is that you never stop serving your country and you never stop contributing for better betterment of the country. So I think, uh, you know, I'll continue to uh, find a role to see how we can further improve the life of fellow Singaporeans. Uh, I've not thought about leading an NGO or starting anything, you know, that can uh, get me that platform. Uh, in the meantime, you know, until I'm a more settled, I'll be very happy to contribute through commentaries, uh, through discussions and through ideas, you know, to help improve things. For example, you know, currently the business environment is really tough. Yes. And, uh, and I'll be very happy to give my suggestions to any agencies and the government. I still have my links to see what we can do to help improve the situation because I think this time around things are going to be a lot more tougher than 2008, yes. 2009. So I'll, I'll give my ideas and contribution, but to formally uh, you know, do it through an organization, I've not thought about it, but I would not... Uh, you wouldn't uh, rule it out. I would not rule it out, uh, maybe in the future. Do, what are your thoughts about the need for uh, a robust civil society at yes. this stage in the development of a country like Singapore? Yeah, you know, uh, I've always had this view that uh, today, you know, in fact, last 15, 20 years, uh, our population is very educated, 
compared to uh, the time when we gained independence. At that point of time, we had a few good men who mm. got together in politics, who determined uh, everything for the country, the future of the country, policies yeah. or any other things, infrastructure and so on. But uh, today, we've got a good group of people who are not in politics or who, who don't want to join politics. And at the same time, the world is a lot more complex. And I don't believe that the leaders who are in politics today can know all the answers. So I believe that uh, we need to involve, sincerely involve, uh, people of all backgrounds who can contribute in any way that they can. We have talents uh, in many areas. Uh, we have experts in many areas who have local and international experience today who are not in government. And it will be a waste if we do not uh, you know, get their views and do not consult them enough uh, seriously and taking their input seriously in formulating policies or making changes. And, and so I, I, I believe that we should involve a lot more, uh, many okay. more people. I mean, th th this is one area that I, I have a particular problem with. I feel that engagement, you know, I mean, there's, a, there's been a lot of engagement. I think the government is sincere in trying to engage elicit responses and concerns, you know, understand the concerns of the ground. But you must agree with me, and you've you have highlighted this before while you were an MP as well as after you stepped down, that we seem to have lost the ability to listen. I mean, there's no point having engagement when you use that engagement to explain your point of view, but really are not listening to what the person is trying to say. And it, sometimes, you know, the person may, may say something, but he's actually meaning something else. Are we putting in enough effort? Have we lost, actually, the ability to listen, government? You know, I, I think, uh, the, like you say, the uh, effort is there, the attempt is there. Uh, engagement, you know, we started uh, in the late 90s with Singapore 21. Yeah, and we were involved in that. We were involved in that. Uh, I was involved in that, too. And then, uh, you know, we made certain recommendations. Uh, I would say my personal feel was uh, of disappointment that we consulted widely, uh, raised expectations, but we did not do everything that we wanted to do uh, or that was recommended. Uh, and then five years later, we uh, created another the remaking. conversation, Remaking Singapore. And five years later, we created another one, Refreshing Singapore. And five years later, we had our Singapore conversation. Yeah. So I think it's very good to engage, uh, but we really need to listen, like you say, and uh, be prepared to make changes if those are relevant and, and, and are needed. And so my uh, uh, hope is that the current leadership uh, will, through the latest uh, exercise of the future economy conversation that we are having, uh, to uh, listen seriously and be prepared to make changes, uh, no, even if they are bold. Why is there this problem of listening? You know, uh, we have a very capable group of people in, uh, in government. Yeah. Uh, of, uh, and and sometimes we know best attitude you know, becomes a hindrance in listening. Yeah. So, uh, well, I think, you know, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, people who are capable, who have succeeded in certain areas in their career, but they cannot know everything. It's a complex world out there. And so it will be useful for them to listen and believe uh, in some of the feedback that comes through. Then I think we'll have uh, good changes and good policies that will help improve you, you, lives. You are talking about what it should be. I'm asking you why it isn't. Why is it? I mean, listening is a natural skill. We all yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, are yeah. given the natural yeah. skill. But why does it appear that some of our political leaders have over time devolved that ability? Yeah, but when you think that you know best, then you will listen less. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think a bit of humility and, uh, you know, willingness to accept that you won't know everything uh, will help change yeah. that. Yeah. Now, let me quote you. Uh, you said this, I found that it was my duty to speak up even though it would have been very unpopular with the ministers and with the government. But that did not hold me back, right? Because I wanted to speak the truth and also push for changes, right? Then you went on to say, every time I challenged the ministers, they came back with a sledgehammer. This was as an MP in Parliament. Yeah. And I know where the sledgehammer was coming from. It was coming from the civil servants and so on. You went yeah, on. Yeah. So, so is it a structural issue where there is a, a natural, there's, a, there's almost this feeling that we need to defend our, our turf, we need to defend our ground, yeah, yeah. whether it's civil servants or ministers. You know, I mean, when I was an MP, I, 
I got the pushback too, mm -hmm. right? But it's not even a question of whether you make sense or not. It's almost as if you need to be pushed back. But is that, why is that happening? Is it, structure, is it structural well, or is I, it attitudinal? I, I think uh, it's both structural and attitudinal. Yeah. Uh, and, and I did make that comment. Uh, make that comment about uh, where it's coming from, from the civil service. If you go back a bit, uh, after 2011 election, uh, uh, I made a speech at a party conference. Yes. And I, I made one point, which I made before in parliament, about greater uh, uh, political judgment in policy making. What I really meant down there was that the ministers need to take charge and not, not the let the civil service. servants drive it. So I hope that you know we have a capable group of ministers right now that uh, that they will take charge and drive the changes. I remember that's how our pioneer generation of ministers uh, you know made changes. But there were debates. And there were there were there were debates between the political leaders as and the civil servants, right? Yeah. Yeah. But in the end, the judgment was made by, by the, the leaders. Yeah. So I think if let's say we can do more of that, uh, I think it will be for the better of Singapore. And uh, otherwise, uh, 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 the ministers are elected by the people, they should know what's happening on the ground, consult with the MPs, and they should know what is it that we really need to do. Civil servants will not know because they, they, they have no reason to be in touch with the ground. They it's not their job. Not their job. Neither do they have the platform or, or the opportunity to do that. And uh, I'm not saying they are no good. You know, they, may have, they are probably very capable, but they just don't know what the impact of some of the things that they want to do is going to be on the people. So I think the best people to do that are ministers because policies are ministers really... Ministers and MPs. Uh, MPs, MPs can give the feedback, but the real decisions and policy changes happen in cabinet. Are the MPs giving the real feedback? I'm talking about the, the ruling party MPs. You know, we do have our party caucus from time to time. There's very good feedback that uh, happens there. You know, there are a number of MPs who do give uh, very good so uh, relevant feedback. Can you feedback. tell us... A, Tell me a little bit more about this party caucus. I mean, how, how honest is it and, and how is it conducted? Well, you know, uh, it, as, as long as I was there, it seemed honest to me. There was an attempt to listen and uh, many of our MPs did speak their mind on, uh, on many issues. Now, whether the ministers took it as a serious session uh, and then to go back and uh, make changes, uh, it's hard for me to tell because, you know, I, 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 do, I don't know. But I tend to believe that, you know, it's a, a serious session that, that then results in some, uh, you know, further discussion at the cabinet level that then results in policy changes. Uh, but there was one, uh, one uh, policy that was not, you know, well uh, discussed and debated among the MPs, ruling party MPs, party MPs, and that was the white paper, population yep. white paper. So, I mean, that was disappointing, you know, because I think we, we uh, if we believed in the caucus, then uh, that discussion would have helped a lot before the paper came out to so, the public. So why didn't it happen? I'm, I'm, I'm and, and this is in the wake of, of the by-elections, yeah. losing the by-elections. Exactly. Then this happened. Yeah. I, I mean, fail to understand why. Yeah. I never understood. Again, it. I guess it still goes back to this whole willingness and the ability to listen, right? Yeah. Because much as PM, PM Lee Sien Lung, when he, I think when he was DPM or when he, was, when he became a new prime minister, he had said, to civil servants and others that we can't assume the monopoly of wisdom, mm, yeah. right? But there's a sense today that there's still an assumption of monopoly of wisdom, you know? You know, I think Prime Minister is sincere about no, it. Prime Minister I, I worked with him for many Prime years, Minister but I, I, you know, I hope that everyone else is also, you know, uh, uh, have that sincerity. Uh, I believe so. I think, you know, uh, we have a good group of ministers right now after the last election. Yes. And uh, we should give them an opportunity, you know, uh, to to really make the changes uh, based on real feedback that they get. So, so we have a chance. PAP has been given a chance, and I would say give them a chance and uh, and, uh, and and judge them on the outcome five years later. Yes. In fact, I think I think as I I, I would agree with you. I, I think we've got a, a a pretty credible slate of of ministers in the cabinet now, uh, and I think Singaporeans in general want to see them succeed for the sake of Singapore. Of course. Right? Uh, so I think Singaporeans are willing to give a chance. Yeah. The fact that so many Singaporeans actually continue to participate in these engagement sessions yeah. shows that yeah. there is still that trust and faith yeah. and a willingness to give the benefit of doubt. Yeah. Right? But it is eroding. It can erode a lot if they don't see what they are highlighting 
being yeah. taken seriously or taken into account. Yeah. What do you think are the consequences of that? You know, uh, it was eroding up yeah. to 2011, uh, and then uh, the government did many things, uh, policy changes and many improvements. And then also, uh, you know, our Singapore conversation, and we listened. And uh, in 2015, the Singaporeans gave the PAP a strong mandate because they believed that the government was indeed listening and willing to change and uh, willing to listen. So I would say that we are at a position right now where the trust has been given back to the PAP and, uh, and, and it's up to the PAP right now, uh, the, the, the current government, to, to, you know, to use that trust wisely, make the changes that are going to help improve lives of fellow Singaporeans. And I think if things are better five years down the road, we will uh, see a, a deepening of the trust that the PAP government got in the last election and that will last them another 20 years yep. of a strong mandate. In, in fact, um, you, you wrote a very long analysis right, on your Facebook. You put it on, on your Facebook account and, um, and, and it was very widely read, uh, both within the party and as well as outside. And you basically made the point that you should, the, 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 I mean, you highlighted the importance of humility in, a, in, in, in the face of this triumph. And uh, let me quote one of the things you said. You said, Singaporeans expect greater humility and personal touch from their leaders, and this will be even more, more so in the coming years as the electorate matures and gets more educated and informed. The government's past, we know best attitude, will not work among Singaporeans in the future. Elitism is also something the PAP government should be concerned about, especially since the party continues to choose the elites to become key appointment holders. I don't think Singaporeans want to see a natural aristocracy develop. Leaders must come from a diverse background and servant leadership is what will work for the future. There's a lot of, inf a lot of it packed here, right? You talk about servant leadership, you talk about natural aristocracy, which was actually a, a term used by PM Lee, right? Uh, you, you talk about the importance of humility, you know. Now, what made you highlight? This is one of your most important concluding statements. Mm -hmm. I don't think you were overly critical of the PAP. Mm -hmm. You were saying that you deserve this win, you earned it. However, you're cautioning. These are cautionary statements. Yeah, yeah. What made you make these statements? Yeah, so, as you say, you know, it was a well-deserved win, a very strong mandate that the PAP got. Uh, and because they did uh, do a lot to address many of the issues that were present before 2011. Do you think the opposition aided the PAP win? Uh, well, that was one of the factors. I think <laughs> if you read my com commentary, you know, uh, uh, in many areas where you, we had big political parties and big uh, uh, candidates, uh, Singaporeans are rejecting. Also, you, you highlighted, you, you singled out that even the Workers' Party lost ground because they were seen as being arrogant. In fact, that's, you know, in, in their rallies uh, especially, they seemed quite arrogant. And also in Parliament, actually, they did not make significant contribution. Uh, you know, they could have done a lot more in challenging policies and uh, proposing alternatives. In fact, they held a very uh, passive and neutral position in most of the policies that came out. So they, you know, they kind of uh, eroded their own support uh, in Parliament and also uh, in the way they behaved. Hmm. Uh, of course, on, on, the, on the government uh, side, um, they deserve this win. But uh, we must not forget all the issues that existed uh, pre-2011 election. And I don't think so. The issues have all gone away yep. suddenly. So, so therefore, we have to take this victory in humility and continue to address the issues that existed in 2011 because there was a big blunder yep. <laughs> before 2011 that resulted in a huge loss of support. Yep. We cannot afford that kind of blunders moving forward. And how do you uh, avoid these blunders if you listen with humility, involve many more people and make the changes that are good for the people and not what just a few people think. But if it's just what a few people think, that's elitism. That you know your group and you... But if you are doing it uh, for the sake, for the improvement of uh, Singapore and lives of Singaporeans, then you know you are a servant leader. You know, you're, you're leading and you're doing it for them, for their sake, not you know, just for a few people. So why, why do you feel that there is a risk of us being elitist? Perhaps we've already become elitist. Some people argue that, or become even more elitist. Why do you think that's bound to happen? That could happen. There's well, a I risk think of that. Uh, if we look at the current cabinet, uh, the background of uh, most of them, you know, they, most of them are scholars or former scholars. 
So, I mean, uh, just by the definition, they are elite group of people. But, you know, they are serving the country and they could uh, serve it, uh, uh, serve the country sincerely and not appear as elitists. You know, they are good people who could do good things for the country. So how do you think, I mean, as an experienced member of parliament, a politician, how do you think a political leader can avoid being viewed in the way he conducts himself as being elitist? What you are know, the things he needs to be mindful of? I think first thing you must uh, uh, accept that you are not expert in everything. So once you have that uh, in your mind, uh, this, that means humility. And I think, you know, really, uh, real engagement with people, listening carefully and uh, to try to really understand what bothers, what worries people, what are the problems people face. Uh, and I think, you know, not just listening to a small group of supporters that you have, but really listening to the general population, people, you know, who, uh, who, who are facing difficulties, who, the men on the street, you know. I think ability to have a direct connection with them it's very important for you to understand uh, what the real issues are. Many a times, uh, uh, some leaders uh, surround themselves with a small group of people, the same people, who give the same feedback, and uh, you know, and so you never. And they're beholden. And they're beholden, Absolutely. maybe, yeah, and you know, but then you really never get to know, and they don't want to deliver bad news, you know, and you, uh, if let's say you know a particular leader made a big mistake, no one will dare to tell him, uh, they will just say, "Well, you've done a good job." But uh, I mean, there must be someone who's prepared to tell him you really made a blunder, you better change it. Very few people are willing to do that. Wouldn't you say that part of this problem um, it, it is because, it, because the party has been in power since 1959 and, and has had a very good track record? I think success does uh, breed arrogance. Yeah. And, and uh, longevity, right? And longevity that, you know, that what worked in the past will continue to, continue to work in the future, that's a danger. So I think we need to realise that it's not always the case. Sometimes it is, you can learn from the past, but the current situations can be very different. So you can't just uh, think that you know best and, uh, and change. So, so um, I, I would say to be, you know, the PAP had attempted many a times to also refresh itself, uh, to try to change the ways uh, the PAP does things. So, so they have tried. And uh, really we have to see whether or not the results are going to be positive. What is holding them from achieving what they're trying? I mean, you said they've tried, yeah. but it's difficult, right? Because you've been, you've been used to a certain way of doing things. I mean, the PAP is a very established, mature animal. You know, it's, it's used to doing things in a certain formula. You know, 2011 yeah. was a wake-up call. So when you move in the wrong direction, you're going to see Shocks. Shocks. So I was, in a way, you know, uh, I shared with uh, some ministers, I was quite glad that the 2011 results were as they were. Because it was not so bad, we, we did not lose that yeah. many seats, but it was enough to wake us up. And we did wake up. Yeah. So sometimes you need shocks to wake you up. But this time around, I hope it's not the shocks. Other way. Yeah, I hope that, you know, we preempt these things and don't allow uh, us to go through another shock. because. Uh, as I s uh, wrote in my uh, article, uh, you know, we have been given a second chance and to deepen our trust. But if you betray this trust, the, we will, you're not, it's not going to come back again. You may not get another chance. may not get another chance. But I, I believe we, we have this chance. We'll make best use of it. The government will. And so far, it seems that they're using their trust. I, 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 don't, I, I have not seen any indication of an abuse of that trust No, so yeah, far. in fact, they've done a good job. I yeah. think the, the, the current leaders, old and new, uh, are really trying very hard. And uh, if they continue like this and address the issues that Singaporeans face, I think we will be good, uh, you know, for PAP will be good for another 20 years. And I think that's good for the country. Yeah. Because we have good leaders, uh, you know, we have a good system and, uh, and a proven uh, uh, approach of solving problems. Uh, just do it right this time. Well, the, the, other, the other issue is, and, and this, is the, this is the kind of feedback I got from talking to quite a few people before this interview, just to get a sense of, of the kind of questions that they would like to raise with you. And one of the questions that, I mean, I asked people, a spectrum of people, what would, you, what would you want me to ask Indigit? And this is one of the things that kept coming up. Why does this government seem to 
distrust anyone who comes to them with a critical point of view. Why is it that someone who is critical, who is openly critical of the government's policy is sometimes seen as the enemy of the state and treated like the enemy of the state? when actually his heart could be very much in the right place. Let's face it, the easiest thing a person can do is to tune out. Yeah. But why, what makes this individual actually go and tell the person in power what you're doing is wrong? He could have not done it. He could have just tuned out and done when... So, this, is, this, this, this question kept coming back from quite a few people. Mm. You know, whether it's a civil service, whether it's a political leadership, that there is a robust pushback the moment you are seen as critical and you're treated like the enemy of the state. Is this true? And if so, how do you think we can deal with this? You know, I personally experienced this uh, in my you know, forums in parliament. Uh, I, I've raised uh, issues uh, which I believe um, uh, needed addressing and, and I did not agree with every policy that the government had you know, implemented and I um, also challenged the ministers on many of the uh, policies and, uh, and, and rules that they were uh, implementing. Uh, and each time I did it, I had a pushback. I, as I mentioned, uh, they yeah. came back with a sledgehammer. But I think, you know, if you sincerely want change uh, to occur, uh, and especially when you have a group of people who may not see, be able to see the real issues, then you have to be a bit thick-skinned to keep on pushing. And, uh, and if you're doing it for the good of the country and not for yourself, I think you'll be prepared for some of this pushback and don't give up. And, uh, and some bruises. And some bruises, sometimes many bruises. Yeah. Uh, so my personal experience is that, you know, I face lots of pushback and uh, bruises, uh, but over time I saw changes, whether it was to do with the, in fact, population white paper. There were immediate changes. Yes. You know, uh, if let's say we did not push the way we push, uh, if all of us just went along and... Uh, and, and during the debate, right? During yeah. the debate, we would have had a white paper without changes. So, you know, although the, the white paper remained as it is, in implementation, the government made many changes that were positive, actually, uh, for Singaporeans. So, so, in some cases, immediate changes because uh, the urgency of the issue, but in some cases, it takes a bit time. Uh, streaming, for example, early streaming in secondary, uh, in primary four. Uh, some of us uh, debated for years and with lots of pushback, finally the change came. You know, I just need to have a bit patient. I wish changes came earlier because we affected the whole generation. Uh, but you know, uh, if you sincerely believe in it, then I think you have to be prepared for all of these bruises and uh, you know, uh, counter attacks. Bruises, I think we can live with because you can put band-aids. But what if you are seriously injured or even fatally injured? <laughs> you know, uh, I think when you're in politics... that fear. Yeah, there is that fear. When you're in politics, then I think you have to understand the rules of the game. I mean, this is... What, what are the rules of the game in Singapore? Uh, different from what are the rules of the game in the US or any other country. So we have our rules of uh, the game. Uh, and I would avoid, uh, you know, uh, uh, things that are not part of the rules. So, for example, slander. You know, when you accuse the Prime Minister of benefiting from CPF money personally, I think that's wrong. Mm. You know, because he did not benefit from that personally. That is, you know, uh, ignoring the rules of the game. But if you had said that the Prime Minister's policies resulted in poor utilisation of CPF money, maybe, you know, you can't, you can't kill a person for that statement. So I think you just have to uh, be prepared, you know, uh, until there are further changes, play within the rules of the, of the game. So, I, so, I, so this whole notion of climate of fear, you know, even as we, we launched uh, IQ, right, uh, we've had many debates in this very studio. We've, I mean, I was very heartened that there are so many people willing to come and state their view in front, on camera, right? I mean, so you see people willing to be to say what they want and be counted, right? That's, a, that's refreshing. Yeah. At the same time, there have been quite a few people, when I invited them to come as panelists or as the audience, they said, I don't want, and I asked them why, they said, because I don't want to be, I don't want to be arrested, I don't want to be blacklisted, I don't want to be yeah. Yeah. a target 
by the government. Why does this fear still seem to linger? You know, I mean, uh, we have a past history of uh, very strong uh, pushback by our pioneer leaders. But that has changed. Uh, and so I think this fear today, will, I would say, is undue, unnecessary. Uh, and uh, especially if you look at uh, uh, some of the opposition candidates who fought the last elections mm. against the PAP, mm. some of them are working in government service or government-related organizations. They are continuing to do well, very well in their careers, in fact. Yep. You know? And uh, so, so I, I think these are examples of, uh, you know, the, uh, of why it's okay you know, to speak up if you believe in it within the rules of the game. And, uh, and not fear that, you know... That, you but know, are the rules changing? The rules have been changing over time. I mean... But there are some basic ones will not change. You know these OB markers, the, the difficult thing about OB markers is you don't know where the markers really are. Yeah. Well, it's always like that. But, you know, uh, in the past, when you criticise a government policy, you used to, you know, get a strong pushback. But today, it's not happening. You know, it's, uh, but, but if you slander a, a, a respectable man, the pushback will come. So I'm saying that, you know, that has changed over time. And I'm sure it's going to continue to, to change. Uh, but for us to be like an American liberal uh, system overnight, I don't it's think so. Comes to, and I don't think that's the, that's the expectation. Not the expectation. So, so your message is there's no real reason to be afraid to speak up. I survived many years, even before I entered politics. In fact, many people do not know that I criticize the PAP policies even before I became a uh, candidate, even before they considered me as a candidate. I remember in one of a closed-door dialogue session, I told the Prime Minister when he was a young minister, he came for a dialogue, and I told him, you know, why would a person with a clear conscience join the PAP as an MP, you know, when the VIP is not going to be lifted? Lifted, yeah. And, uh, you know, so I... You, gave, you can't vote according to your yeah, conscience. So I, I, I argued my case quite vigorously. Some years later, he invited me to join him. So, you know, I think uh, the climate has changed. Uh, people are willing to listen and, and give you an opportunity. And I would encourage Singaporeans to speak your mind if you're constructive. We are a small country, let's not be destructive. But I think if you have constructive criticism and you can back them up, even better. And, and then, you know, speak with the right people. There are many opportunities right now. We have many conversations. Uh, and uh, many of the ministers are also very accessible, actually, compared to the past. What is your... What is your understanding of constructive criticism? What is constructive and what is not constructive? I think constructive means we're going to improve things and not make things worse. To me, that's a very simple definition. So if I were to tell you that, if you're a minister, and I, if I were to tell you, I don't agree with your policy at all. So it's not a question of even improving the policy. I think your policy doesn't work. Is that constructive? I think that's not constructive. You why? Know, that, that you are not giving, you, you, you have to explain why. No, no. Uh, if I explain to you why, yeah, yeah. but I, I'm, I'm not tweaking, I'm not suggesting how you can improve or tweak your policy. I'm saying that your policy is fundamentally flawed. Does it mean that I'm being unconstructive? No, I think that's, that's if, you, if you have a good uh, reason for it. Now, who can, decides whether it's a good reason or not? I, the, the public will decide at the public, end. Public or the receiver? The, the receiver uh, the, you see, if the receiver keeps on ignoring, he will not get public support in the long term anyway. In I the mean, long term? Yeah. So in the short term, you may feel that it's, uh, you know, uh, well, the, the white paper is something that I did not disagree, uh, did, did not agree with. I did not vote for the white paper. Yeah. So, you know, you, uh, there was a message I wanted to deliver. And I think, uh, you know, we should be bold enough to do it. But, you know, I did it for the good of Singaporeans and for the yeah, country. So constructive doesn't mean that you've always got to, to accept the policy. Yeah. And That's not mean it. that the receiving party accepts it. Yeah. yeah but you, I think you have to argue. But there has to be that trust, the willingness to listen to the other party, even if it means that he's telling you you're talking rubbish. Yeah. He may not use that, when, in, he say it in so many words, but if he's telling you, you're not making any sense. And, and I have been told that many times but I did not give up. So I'm saying that the environment has changed quite a lot, that people should... Do you think so? Do you honestly think so? I believe so? so. Do you think our political leaders are more thin-skinned these days or more th thick-skinned? No, I think they are, they are getting more and more thick-skinned. They are willing to listen. You sure? Yeah, uh, especially among the younger ministers. Prime Minister, for example, you know, we, behind closed doors, we give him a lot of feedback. Now, what he does with it is really up to him and the cabinet. But, you know, he's Behind never... closed doors is one. Yeah. But in the open, if 
if a minister or prime minister or DPM is being openly criticized, but with, by people with the heart in the right place, are they, in, are they willing to accept it as coming from a, from a good place? I think if it's coming from a good place, well argued from a person who knows his staff, yeah. I think it'll be accepted. And even if it's strong? Even if it's strong. You think so? I think so. Okay. That's very heartening. Yeah. Right? Now, since we're talking about this, I'd like to go into one other area. And you talked about this in your, in your uh, general election review. The whole notion of likability. This is another thing that keeps coming up. Why can't the PAP or the ministers or the MPs in the PAP be a lot more likable? I think many of them are likable now. Okay. A few may not be likable. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, okay. I don't want to okay. name names. Let's not talk about them those are who are not likable. <laughs> yeah. But likability, you must agree, likability is different from being populist, right? Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, we agree that you don't want populist yeah. politicians. Yeah. But there is a premium for likability. Yeah. You know, when you like somebody, you know, like, like DPM Tharman, a lot mm. of people like him. Yeah. And there are certain qualities that the person has that you one of which is that he's authentic, right? Now, why does it seem that, that, that quite a few of the PAP leaders, even though they're likable on a one-on-one -on -one basis, the moment they assume that persona, they become very, not so dislikable, but they, 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 they tend to be quite distant and stiff. You know, I've uh, seen four terms of parliament. I've seen the different leaders, leaders uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in charge. And I, I want to say that uh, these days we have many more like, many like more likable than more likable. <laughs> so over time, uh, it may be because we are getting more likable people in, or it may be that, you know, because that is one of the qualities of a good politician that you must be likable, people must trust, trust you and willing to, you know, speak with you and, uh, and, and confide in you. So I think, you know, we are getting uh, people who are doing that and, and, uh, and the ministers are also trying to be likable. Some of them just cannot change, you know, and they maybe should uh, be less in front of the public and uh, compared to those who are likable. You know, in the last GE, one of the reasons why PAP won many more votes was because the Prime Minister was very likable. It was a strategy. Yeah. He had posters all over and it was very important. So it does show that likability in politics is very important, not populist, but being likable. So, since we're talking about likability, why is it not possible for a non-Chinese to become the Prime Minister? What are your views on that? I think, uh, I think this will change, uh, is changing and will continue to change. If he's a capable man, I think the public will accept. If that's a guy who is among the whole slate is the one who's going to help you improve your life, improve your country, I think Singaporeans are wise enough to choose the right person, uh, even if it's a minor minority. You know, I saw this in well, why does why does PM time and time again say, you know, that Singapore is not yet ready? Well, I think we can... But anecdotally, it doesn't seem that way. It doesn't seem that way. I mean, my first, uh, first um, uh, experience with this was when we had our first uh, Singapore Idol. Mm. Mm. Was yes. it Taufik, I Taufik, think? Taufik. It was based on popular votes yep. and he won. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of, and I don't remember the incident, yes, I say that yes. Singaporeans are mature. Even though you're only 14% of the population. Correct, yeah. And he was good and he deserved it. And I think in politics, it's going to be the, the same. You know, so uh, we can put it up to test uh, at the appropriate time uh, as the population get more mature and understands uh, more, uh, gets involved more politically. Uh, I think they will see, you know, if let's say this is the right guy for my country to improve my life, improve the country, I think they will choose. Uh, we have, you know, maybe some people who will not, but I think very f that's changing very fast. Do you think, I mean, one of, the, one of the criticisms we had, Singapore government in the 1960s, about Malaysian politics, is that Malaysian politics is communal, yeah. right? And we are non-communal in our politics. But over time, we have become, we're not racist, but we've become highly racialized, right? I mean, even this whole debate about 
whether a non-Chinese can, even, no matter how capable you are, whether Singaporeans are willing to accept. I mean, these are racial arguments. They're yeah. not racist. Mm. They're racial arguments. Do you, think, do you think this could be, if you don't watch it, this could become uh, a stumbling block for real progress? Because we are talent scarce. We need to be able to throw talent up, regardless of race, language, or religion. Do you think this is going to become an issue if you don't address it squarely? I don't think so. It's a very serious issue in these days and times. Uh, that, that if you look at the cabinet today, we have uh, you know, uh, many capable people, uh, Indian ministers, who, you know, who over-represent the population, actually. But because they are capable, they are you know, in, in, in cabinet. So I think you know we are when we find good people we are willing to put them up into the positions and let them you know do the job for the good of the country. So I don't think so. It's uh, that uh, serious an, an issue. But yes, you know we have to watch uh, that we do not become racial in some of this, these things. Uh, some policies may seem that way, but I think uh, the intent was not. For example, self-help groups. Yeah. You know uh, uh, the the reason was not racial. In, I think. But the, the consequence has been, you know, that we, we highlight the racial differences more. But so we, need to, we need to watch that as well, right? We need to watch that. The and optics. I, the optics of exactly. it. Exactly. And, uh, you know, so, for example, you know, uh, in outreach, you can uh, do it at, uh, along racial lines, but in, in organizing uh, uh, activities or fundraising, it could be done uh, uh, collectively. Do, I think you think, do you think the time has come for us to declutch on... on on overemphasis of race, I, I think you know uh, if you even look at the interracial marriages that are happening right now, it's yeah. quite large numbers. If you just speak with the young, whether are they color blind? In fact, they are, mostly are, and so we have now increasingly new generations who don't see differences among the races, and you know uh, while it's good that we continue to promote our. A culture and you know and and and, and stay entrenched in the in our value systems. I think in some areas we can let go. Well, we we have about um, we have a couple of minutes left, so I'd like to ask you this question. Now that you are outside, you've stepped out of politics, right? What are some of the three things that you want to see changed mm -hmm. in society? You know, first of all, uh, you know, it's along the lines of the racial discussion that we have. I think a national identity needs to develop. In my opinion, we were doing very well until the 1980s. Hmm. And then we took a step back. And since then, uh, you know, uh, I, I think we did not, were not able to create a very clear national identity among Singaporeans. And in the 90s, and uh, in fact, in the 2000s, things became worse because we brought in many more foreigners. And so today we have a situation where integration is not hap happening as well as we want to. People don't identify together as a Singaporeans as much as we want to. And so I think you know my wish is that we focus on uh, on what it takes to develop a national identity for Singaporeans because in times of difficulty, this commonness among us is what's going to help us pull through a difficult uh, period. So that's one. The second thing is, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, former Prime Minister Go Choktong called it the Swiss standard of living. Mm. I would really love to see Singaporeans having a quality of life that's a lot more better than what they face in the past. Uh, simply uh, uh, because cost of living has gone up very high, wages have not caught up with it. So we really need to focus on how we can improve the quality of life of Singaporeans by seriously addressing this wage and income and, and cost of living uh, gap. And uh, so, so we, we should attempt to go back and talk about achieving a certain standard of living, whether it's a Swiss standard at a certain period of time, so that you know, uh, people do feel, uh, along with national identity, that this is my home and, uh, and not feel that this is just a hotel, especially when we have so many foreigners coming into Singapore. So right. I think this is another thing. The third area is now widely discussed recently, and that is political, uh, uh, I wouldn't say reform, but you know, restructuring. Uh, there is some debate about uh, what changes uh, need to happen uh, because we have a more politically mature population who can get more involved. Mm. And there are many more people who are capable of contributing, not just in parliament, and how we can uh, get more of them uh, involved. Plus also the, the, the need uh, among Singaporeans of an alternative view 
uh, the current composition in parliament is not ideal yeah. because you know it's still overwhelming majority of PAP. So I think we really need to see a system develop where we have a lot more participation, uh, greater representation and more experts coming in to help solve the issues. And, and that's probably in the form of, possibly in the form of a, a, a two-chamber house, yeah. a bicameral system. A bicameral system is something that I said, I think that is the, probably the one that can get us uh, uh, the greatest results. Uh, and this will address issues like having experts who will not want to come into politics. Exactly who could in fact in an upper house also you know, be appointed as ministers. Yep. If let's say you don't have the right person you know, in, in, in the lower house to... Uh, much like what uh, Manmohan Singh you Man know, was appointed Singh, yep. as a prime yep. minister to the, to the upper house. It will also help us address the issue of uh, certain bills actually being scrutinised and questioned by independent group of people. Who are uh, experts. Uh, who are experts rather than you know, second and third reading being done yes. so quickly and people have a question whether indeed was the debate well done. It also will address this question of whether the elected presidency is still relevant in Singapore. I think the idea of a president with custodial powers is still relevant today. I mean, when Mr Lee Kuan Yew thought about this, he knew what he was talking about, that you know, we have to have some important things being safeguarded yeah. by a person different from the prime minister. So you need a president, but whether the president needs to be elected or could he be selected from an upper house among the group of wise men who, who formed the upper house. I think by the two-chamber system, we solve many issues uh, that Singaporeans desire and this will be real political reform uh, and political restructuring. So these are the three wishes for... Excellent. So I'd like to say welcome to civil society <laughs> and I look forward to you uh, being a leader of civil society because really that's the ultimate check and that's the best way to get people engaged and involved. So I say welcome to civil society. <laughs> Thank Indigit. you. I'll do my part. <laughs> well, that was Indijit Singh, um, one of the most respected, finest members of parliament we've had in the recent past at least. Right. Um, and um, so log in to our website www.iq.sg to watch our next IQ hit list, who the guest is. Click the links to see who the other guests have been who have appeared on our program in the past. Post your comments on social media and let us know if there's someone you would like us to interview on hit list.